Hello and welcome to today's Crossing Borders broadcast. Uh, before we start, I just want to thank those of you um, who have been uh, joining us every Wednesday uh, and Thursday. Uh, of course, recordings of the past sessions are available on our YouTube channel. Uh, so please uh, go to YouTube and search Investment Migration Council and there you'll be able to access the back catalogue um, of our broadcasts. So a little bit of housekeeping before we kick off, uh, because we do want to make this as interactive as possible. Uh, you can ask questions using the GoToWebinar widget, which is on the right of your screen. Uh, there are nearly 100 uh, viewers that have registered for today's session. Uh, so we will try and get through uh, as many of your questions as possible. To keep you engaged, we'll have uh, a few polls, uh, as we do uh, on every broadcast, which will come up on your screens. So we're going to run a small test right now to make sure that you are seeing that. And we'll give you five seconds to answer the question. Okay, I can see that we still have uh, a few clicks coming through. All right, that's still coming through right now. All right, that's stopped and let's close that off and share the results with you. So I'm not sure, can my panel, my fellow panelists in Asia, can you see the results of the poll? Yes, I can see that. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yes. Yeah. Yes, I got so, it. Overwhelmingly, you have, uh, we have an audience of um, Europeans, Africans, followed by uh, the Americas. So we define the Americas as North and South America, uh, and that's closely followed by uh, Middle East and Asia Pacific. So that's quite interesting for us to have uh, and good for us to know. So also in the widget you can find a handout presentation and the usual information about the IMC and then later on there's a short video uh, so do stay with us uh, until the end of the broadcast. Uh, today's event is uh, very kindly sponsored by Henley and Partners uh, and today I'm delighted to be co-hosting with Jennifer Lyle. Uh, Jennifer is the Managing Partner and Head of North Asia at Henley and Partners um, and she is of course the IMC Regional Representative Officer uh, for the region. Uh, Jennifer oversees the major markets uh, of Hong Kong, uh, China, South Korea, Taiwan, Japan and Macau uh, and all of these uh, at the comfort of her office and her home at the moment. Uh, because presumably uh, it's difficult to travel uh, right now. So welcome to Crossing uh, Borders, Jennifer. Uh, many of our viewers will be captivated by uh, the title of today's broadcast, which is uh, Back to Work in Asia, uh, or is it really Back to Work in Asia? Uh, what is happening uh, in Asia? I know you've got some very knowledgeable speakers uh, with you. One of them is uh, a member of the IMC Governing Board, uh, one is a founder member of the IMC Asia chapter. Uh, but before you introduce um, your Asian colleagues, can you please share with us what is going on in, in Asia? What is the situation on the ground, Jennifer? Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, yes, I mean, like, it's a very, indeed, a uh, very interesting uh, topic back to World Asia. I'm very positive and confident that we'll soon we, we were back to normal. Um, well, um, on the 28th of April, actually, the chief executive for Hong Kong has made a uh, announce in the um, uh, the press conference that the majority of the government's um, offices and employees will return to work next week. So this is a very good sign um, to to the offices in Hong Kong, uh, which is I think Trico, uh, Joe, and Oscar in Hong Kong that we share the same view. And of course, in China, um, they, they have been um, 
uh, better measures uh, compared to Hong Kong. And um, in the early days, that we know that there's a lockdown. But now I see a lot of people actually traveling um, in the, the regions. They're, they're flying around in Asia, uh, in China. So I think that's a very good sign, very positive sign for us to back to work. Yeah. So um, who are your speakers, your fellow oh. panelists today, please, Jennifer? Yes. So I'm very glad to, to have a three uh, uh, old friends and then a great speakers with us today. And uh, first is uh, from my left to right would be Oscar Liu, the, uh, the CEO of the NOAA Holdings International Limited Hong Kong, which is obviously Hong Kong and China. And also I have uh, Joe Wang, the chief executive of uh, Trico Hong Kong. And also um, David Chen, from, um, uh, the, who is the managing director of the Visas uh, Consulting Group uh, based in Shanghai. So thank you very much for, for joining this uh, panel with myself and Bruno uh, and, and sharing your insights about uh, backing, uh, back to work in Asia. So um, being the advisory industry, advising a lot of high net worth individuals, um, and 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 uh, organization in, in the um, finance and then immigration industry on the resident and citizenship. We we often see a lot of high net worth um, clients with touch about the global business solutions, the wealth management, uh, and like a family trust insurance investment planning, or also the migration planning. Um, for the Chinese to 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 move overseas, so I like to, uh, of course, to to invite my my panelists and discuss all these topics today, and uh, what are the challenges and and what are what do you see in the post COVID nineteen? Um, so my first questions I would like to to address to to Joe, um, Joe, because you are you are the CEO of Tricor. And then, uh, which is the leading business expansion specialist in, in Asia with a lot of uh, global knowledge and the local expertise in the business operation, corporation, investor, human resources. Um, I noticed that in a, even though during the COVID-19, the first quarter of, of the 2020, um, I see some um, business expansions and also I see some merger and acquisition and, and IPO, uh, even the acquisition of Tricor, uh, I mean, uh, acquire some new firms. That's, that's quite a very interesting uh, um, to see. So what's your views on, on the business, uh, COVID-19 business resilience and what are the, um, the preparedness or your actions during this um, uh, period of time? Sure. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, first of all, I would first wish everybody good health in Europe and, and the rest of the world. Uh, Hong Kong has been has been has gone through a very tough period, but we are now on the fourth day of zero uh, infections, which is good news. So back to your question, uh, uh, Jennifer. Yes, we uh, we did close an M and A during the first quarter of the year in Malaysia, and in fact, we are on track to close another two in Hong Kong before the, the, before the end of the year. And if I look back to our decision-making process was when we were hit with COVID-19 uh, after Chinese New Year, which is about in February, we made a very conscious decision on focusing on our cash flows, meaning we count every dollar coming in and count every dollar going out. And that's also discipline we, uh, we, 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 we took on when we discussed M&As with potential targets. What we see in the market was cash is strapped. Lots of startup companies or even healthy companies, all of a sudden they hit a wall. So it's actually an opportunity for us to go in there and buy healthy businesses during this period of time. And having said that, again, we have the view that, you know, we think in the long term, we stuck to a strategy on expanding uh, in, in this part of the region. You also mentioned about IPOs. Uh, we just did an account on the first quarter. Hong Kong has 30 IPOs uh, in the first quarter. And year on year, it's about the same level as 2019, 2018. So I asked myself, why so many IPOs? Yeah. And the question is very, very obvious. Again, lots of um, businesses are actually rushing out for IPOs because banks shut their doors. And IPO is probably the only way they can get a a cash injection, so to speak. So yeah, IPO, we, we are, remain very optimistic in the coming quarters. 
of being a, a, a strong market. Hong Kong is still number one uh, in, 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 in the IPO. And yes, m &As, there are some good opportunities out there. Wow, that's very uh, promising and very positive uh, news. Um, and I actually, I also uh, discussed this uh, about the quarter one's uh, uh, market uh, uh, overview and outlook for with some of our uh, um, friends in the, in the financial institutions. And um, very interestingly, I also uh, um, uh, actually had a chance to look at the video uh, discussions uh, interview between the Sequoia and Blackstone. I think um, this. Uh, I think this is very interesting that of seeing that how uh, Mr. Shang was commenting about the long China. So this is a question I'm going to to address to to Oscar. So I mean, like over the years, that uh, China being the fastest economic growth country, average um, like 10% uh, of growth in the in annually of 10%, and it's the second largest economy in the world right now. Um, we have witnessed a lot of uh, investors, Chinese investors, investing offshore through different financial vehicles and platforms. I think NOAA Holdings, which is listed in the New York Stock Exchange, um, is a leading wealth and asset management um, companies in China and focusing on serving the high net worth individuals. Um, being the CEO of NOAA Hong Kong, um, what's your, your view of uh, um, um, the uh, economic impact for China and the Hong Kong markets during the COVID-19 and what's your interpretation of this um, uh, long China advice which is um, mentioning in, in the, um, um, the interview um, of the, uh, the Sequoia and Blackstone and what, what are your, your clients' feelings um, and uh, motivations of, on their investments? And what would be your advice, for example, for, for the Chinese investor, or maybe even from the um, offshore, the European market or American market to look, look back to China? Well, what's your view on that? Okay, thank you, Jennifer. And then from my point of view, I think first of all that I would like to share about my view about the global economics. I think today uh, the, the uh, pandemic is not uh, it's not like SARS or what happened in 2003 in Asia, especially in, in China and Hong Kong. I think today this pandemic is really incredible and uh, unpredictable. And it caused, really caused, get many, many damage to the, I think to the financial economy and uh, to the substantial economy, especially in China and Hong Kong. I think for, for, for point of my, uh, my example, my company uh, in the Q1 of this year, our new business fell by 29% and our uh, global insurance business fell by 77%, which is very big damage for us. But fortunately, we have a very good cash flow and the cash management in our company. But you can imagine that many, many companies, real, uh, uh, real companies in, in the world has really got the damage, not from the financial perspective, but also to the substantial economic size. So my investors, all our investors, and most of them are high net worth clients or private banking clients, they are now, most of them are now very horrible and very fear about their position, the investment portfolios, whatever in, in our companies or, or private bankings. So I think most of the investment uh, currently is freeze. Uh, and to wait and see, they don't want to buy, they don't want to redeem, they just want to see what happened next in the world. So that is very, very big issue for 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 us. So so I think first of all, I want I want to pay attention to to our clients that they have to be careful about their uh, their their cash management, their liquid issue, and the, and 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 the, and the return of their investment portfolios, and. Uh, I think I think uh, after or post uh, COVID-19, I guess I and I believe that uh, all of us in the world will go into another new era, which is called the near uh, near to zero interest rate world. That means that many many uh, 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 developed uh, regions or, or countries like U.S., like China, like European countries, they will do the helicopter money. They will to print money, many monies to 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 invest in the market. So we will have to meet a very low and even negative interest interest rate to 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 the to the world. 
that is very bad for for our investment. Uh, so I I I I appreciate and I I agree with the 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 agreement and the talk about uh, uh, Neil Shen from Secura said that we on, we want to launch China. I think I agree that be, not not because that uh, uh, the China is beautiful, China is perfect. I think there are a lot of the problems in China, especially for ec economic size. But I, what I want to say that today, this word is not the word to compare who is the best, but to compare who, a, who is not the worst. Every country has their own problem, big problems. But uh, we are also comparing with the other countries or economic regions that who is not the worst. Comparing with the other uh, countries, economic regions like uh, Europe, like US, Japan, and the emerging markets, et cetera, et cetera, I think maybe there are the more, a little bit more opportunities for investment in China. But it also depends on what happened to do, what the next plan for Chinese government. Do they really want to open more for the, for the industry? To, to, to absorb more money uh, and uh, to welcome more uh, foreign investors to go, go back to, to China. So I think this is really, really important. And as you see that during the Q1 this year, some of the um, countries, the government said that, please go back to my country, go back to US, go back to Japan, because the concentration risk for the supply chain of the industry is very, very high because most of the supply chain uh, is in China. They don't want to do, take the such uh, concentration risk. But for the investors, for the high net worth individuals, I think it still has the concentration risk. So I still emphasize our clients that uh, diversity is really important in this world. You have to diversify your money in different economic uh, regions not only in China, but also in Hong Kong, in Japan, in US. So that's just very important. Thanks. All right. Can I just come in there, Oscar? Because that's very interesting. What you know, you're saying that essentially that you know, Asian investors, particularly Chinese, they're holding on to their assets. They're not liquefying. Uh, cash is king at the moment. They're sitting back, observing what's happening. Um, now, before we move on, um, because I've got a poll uh, that's been set up on today's session for this, uh, looking at which industries will present uh, the best opportunities in the post-COVID-19 uh, world. Uh, but I think it's a good time to bring in uh, David Chen, who's in uh, Shanghai at the moment. Good, uh, good evening, David. Hi, yeah. Perfect. Hello. And can you perhaps give us a, um, a rundown? Uh, what is the situation uh, in Shanghai and perhaps you know the Greater China area at the moment? Uh, in regards to COVID-19, is it back to business uh, as normal from your perspective? And it's it's very good to see you're in good health as well. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, of course, in general, I, I think uh, I, most of the business, at least uh, those business uh, related industry and business related to the uh, medical, the uh, uh, for most of the business, I had uh, I had got a lot of hurt because of the pandemic of the coronavirus. Uh, back into uh, our business, like immigration business, I think uh, it also uh, uh, has been uh, heard a lot. You know, in, uh, in China, like Hong Kong, and, and uh, we, uh, we, made the, uh, we had the uh, pandemic, uh, I think, uh, at the first step. So I, I, I think I, I until to like uh, the end of the March, uh, a lot of people they are still like uh, uh, keep uh, at home, and uh, I, I think the, the situation is looks like very panic. Not only in Shanghai, I guess also maybe a little bit in Hong Kong. <laughs> okay, so and then right now uh, in Shanghai, I think most of the cities in China, I think uh, we're already back to uh, work, but. Uh, for immigration business, we feel like still like market is very quiet. I think uh, there are a couple of reasons. First of all, is uh, I think uh, it's because of uh, you know the economic. Right now, I think things a lot of business they, they get hurt because of the pandemic of the uh, coronavirus. So I think uh, 
uh, average uh, in general people they they are either they are busy to save their own business or they even if they have a cash but uh, because of uncertain of the future near future so people they don't want to spend it i think that's the uh, most important reasons mm -hmm. of course uh, there is another reason for our business especially for immigration business <clears throat> for example like a european uh, uh, program like a Portugal, like great, uh, like great golden visa program. It's uh, like uh, uh, most of people they, they purchase property, and so they want or they need to travel to the uh, to the yeah, local. Point, so, well, you know, in regards to, I'm in Europe here, so I know that there are no flights coming in and out of China except for repatriation mm -hmm. flights. Um, I'm not sure what the situation is regards to North America. I know you do a lot of business with Canada and North America. Uh, what, what is the situation in regards to the opening of the airways between China and, uh, and Toronto, Montreal, New York, Washington, and so forth? Is there any no, date set? Uh, no, I think uh, at least for, for United States, uh, you know, the Trump government, they had the ban to, uh, uh, to uh, the, uh, the now U.S. citizens including Chinese, like a long time ago, that uh, the ban is still like uh, in here. So uh, there's almost no people travel to, uh, especially uh, for like uh, tourists and uh, even for business people, it's uh, hard to travel to the United States, even mm -hmm. if you want to take a risk <laughs> on the plane, right? <laughs> okay, and uh, then for Canada, I think uh, they only I'm not sure, but only like a very, very little uh, I, I, uh, <clears throat> uh, flight for each week. It's almost like a one, one, once or twice a week. So it, it means uh, like uh, the, the, the flight between uh, uh, China and uh, uh, those uh, Americans is uh, uh, almost like stop. Right. Okay. And, and just one more thing. Do you know, is the uh, American consulate or um, uh, um, uh, or the Canadian consulate, are they open for meetings, appointments with uh, foreign no, investors? Not yet. Not yet. Uh, not yet. They, they, they don't open yet. Okay. Jennifer, I know you've got some other questions. Yeah, so it's very interesting what uh, um, uh, David uh, has shared because we all we are in the same uh, industry, right? So we actually suffer also in the first quarter with people not uh, wanting to go to the places where they require to be landed with biometrics uh, in their countries. Um, but I think uh, now we also see starting to see uh, people with movements which is wanting to to. Uh, to, to like what Oscar or maybe um, Joe mentioned earlier, to do more IPOs overseas, uh, more investment overseas, even, I mean, considering to obtain alternative uh, resident or citizenship. It's very interesting that uh, I think Oscar and Joe mentioned about um, cash management was something that um, both companies are very, um, I think, um, focusing in doing it during the uh, uh, virus uh, period of time, which is, I think, David and I, we probably shared uh, the same low view that uh, cash management is very important for our industry as well, right? Yes. Yeah, sure, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because, yeah, so, so of course that, I mean, like, we see now we all, like, I would say Hong Kong uh, will start to back to the normal pretty soon, and probably China, as uh, David, where you are in there right now, we're back to, to all, uh, back to work very soon, which is probably we see, um, so we see some of the, the measures being eased in Europe. Um, and I think that we really sincerely hope that Europe will be back to, to the, uh, the normal again very soon. So our business will be, um, you know, open up again. And so what, what's your um, views on um, the post-COVID-19, for example, um, and this is going to be a question that I like to ask Oscar. What, what do you see about, uh, for example, um, what, what do you see, sorry, about the um, benefits or maybe what are the opportunities you see post-COVID-19 and what are the industries you would think that would be more, uh, which is oh. according to the poll questions? <laughs> sorry. Can we launch that poll now? Shall we do that? Yeah, maybe we should launch that poll before <laughs> Oscar answer the questions and see Let's if you get it right. Audience. Thanks. We'll give you four more seconds to answer that.
All right, still a lot of movement. All right, we're going to close that now and let's share the results of that. <laughs> so, so that's open for discussion, Jennifer, Oscar, Joe and David. Wow. Jennifer. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I see that. Interesting, yeah. Yeah. Biomedical AI. Mm. Oh, that's on financial services, huh? So maybe Oscar, you want to kick off the discussion on that, and I could leave that on the screen. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think that the uh, I think that the answers to 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 the polls are similar to my answers. I think my my point of view very clear and straightforward. I I I think the uh, the first the first industry it will be will be benefits will be better than other industries after uh, uh, after the pandemic is the online services, online uh, service providers, online schools, online training institutions. I think this is uh, obviously every, everyone knows that online business is really important to for our how for our new life after after the after the COVID nineteen. And secondly, I I think the 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 medical thing. Of course, everybody knows that that this is the pandem pandemic is uh, really damaged to our uh, global the public health system. So I think the 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 so-called the, the the medical industry is really a good industry to invest not only for the innovative medicine pills to the hospital building to the medical services etc cetera, etc cetera. and the last one I I, I really uh, think that the financial services especially for uh, 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 for the private banking services wealth management services insurance service uh, business will be a big jump uh, after the COVID-19 because I believe that some of or most of the the entrepreneurs, not only in China, Hong Kong, and the globally entrepreneurs, they will lose money in their business, in their companies. So they want to get more money from the investment side. They want to buy the stocks, they want to buy the bonds, they want to buy the investment portfolios to get more return from the investment side. So I think for the financial services to high net worth individuals will be a not only the v-shaped return but a little bit u-shaped return after the COVID-19 so so that's my my point of view very interesting and um so shall we um how about Joe what what would be um what would be your views on the post uh COVID-19 and what's your your business strategies and and after the uh, um the virus yeah, um, I think echoing what Oscar and David has said, post COVID-19 will fundamentally change the way we work, the way we meet. Mm -hmm. That's why uh, in the past couple of months, we've been investing a lot in R&D actually, and AI in how to assist, uh, for example, uh, let's say companies conduct their AGMs. Now, AGMs are very different from the webinars that we're doing now, because AGMs are a, a platform for shareholders to vote. So these are the things that we're putting resources on. Hopefully, when when COVID-19 is over, uh, then we have the we have the right tools for our clients to conduct AGMs. Uh, number one, first of all, of course, is adhering to social distancing social distancing rules, as well as in compliance with relevant laws and regulations. So these are the things that we are looking into. Um, post COVID-19, I guess it's a million dollar question. The Hong Kong has rolled out a 80 billion Hong Kong dollars program, roughly a 10 billion Hong, uh, US dollars program, where they encourage um, employers not to lay off any staff. So mm -hmm. it's very interesting. The first payment will come in June, and it's, it's a huge amount of money into the market. And hopefully, if we can keep the unemployment rate down, which is at about 4% now, uh, Hong Kong will come out in the next 12 months uh, much stronger uh, in terms of rebound, if at all. That, that, that's very good. And um, how about you, David? Well, what do you see? Because um, based on your um, perspective, uh, what, what's your view or, or maybe the strategies after the uh, the COVID-19 in the migration industry? Would you see that more uh, Chinese would be looking for other options of uh, moving 
for example, to getting more residency or, or getting other uh, citizenship overseas? And would they be mm -hmm. investing more on the uh, programs with the property investment? What's your view and what's your strategies? Okay, okay. So for my view, I think it really depends on first how long the COVID-19 <laughs> will, will be. <laughs> <laughs> will be last, whether there will be the second wave come back. So we call it post COVID 19. So when is the time for the post? Okay. So if it's a uh, uh, last uh, quite for, for example, they like come back in the, uh, this winter and uh, uh, come back again uh, next year. So I, I, I think it will be huge in, uh, impact to the, uh, to the economic, not only uh, in China, but also to the whole world. So, uh, so I think that's a very, very important. How long the uh, 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 the economic will be uh, will be very very uh, negative uh, impact. Okay. So then, uh, secondly, uh, it's like uh, how bad of the economic business, how bad of the economic uh, after the uh, after the COVID nineteen. Uh, I think uh, right now for uh, mm -hmm. my view for the investing business. Of course, like you say, most important for us is like uh, uh, we, have, we we need to keep our cash. So I guess uh, actually it's already happened in China there, but I heard that there are a lot of uh, Chinese immigrant agencies they actually they are doing uh, they are they are reducing their uh, uh, company size, uh, especially for uh, for those uh, uh, those firms they, they are like big or, or middle size they they, they, they try to uh, reduce the, uh, the cost uh, for for the business, and uh, also they are trying to uh, extend the uh, the service ground. What I mean is like uh, uh, before they are only uh, some agents they only focus on the migration service, but right now maybe they think about to keep, uh, to provide more business. For example, to have a partnership with uh, like Oscar's firm to provide like a uh, insurance uh, to uh, try to get more like uh, revenue from uh, one uh, one investor, one client. Uh, of course, I think uh, on the other side for uh, COVID nineteen, I think uh, it might be some uh, <clears throat> uh, opportunity for the energy industry, especially uh, some countries uh, after a. Uh, uh, COVID-19, some countries, if they they can, uh, they can have like some like uh, attractive and also uh, some like a good program. So uh, I think it will be very good to uh, attract more people to uh, to back to the immigration uh, demanding. Yeah, I think this is a very uh, uh, a good uh, comment because I think I share the view of uh, David that we would need to be to have more attracting uh, programs to be launched yeah. so then the yeah. more clients uh, I think around the world can be investing overseas again through the resident or citizenship program or even for the the properties overseas property uh, program I think this is something that we probably have to 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 hope that more countries will open up. Uh, is this something that Bruno that you would be hosting some some uh, some uh, more webinar in futures that we will be hearing some other countries uh, uh, the head of the CIU will be launching some uh, new ideas or, or programs? Well, look, we know that um, certainly in the case of Cyprus and Malta, both countries are within the European Union, um, and they've been categorically clear. Um, in their correspondence with the European Commission um, and Brussels uh, in respect of the continuation of their programs. So both have written to the Commission and said, our intention is to continue operating citizenship by investment programs. What we do know is that Malta um, will make some tweaks and changes to its citizenship by investment programs, uh, improving uh, on it. It's already a very good program, uh, but they are planning some, um, some improvements. I'm not at liberty to, um, to share any more information about that, though. Um, and then, you know, moving along, of course, you know, within the periphery of Europe, you have uh, Moldova, which is a relatively new program. 
We now have also Montenegro, um, so that's within the EU. You mustn't forget, of course, also um, that you know in Ireland you have um, a residency program that quickly can turn into a citizenship program, uh, also. So you know there is a fair amount of movement uh, within the EU, uh, both in citizenship and the residency planning space. Uh, there remain some very attractive options. We do sometimes hear rumours that come and go in respect of. Uh, Greece, which has a very successful um, residency program, that program itself launched only a few years ago, has actually overtaken the US EB5 program in terms of capital coming into the country. So that program is, you know, attracted in excess of you know, uh, billions of um, euros, and I think about 90% of those clients are um, mainland Chinese. Mm. So that's one to follow, uh, because if there are, if there is the launch of uh, a Greek citizenship by investment program, that is very, very attractive for, for Chinese investors. Yeah. Also, it has close proximity to, to China in comparison to, um, you know, to Malta or to Moldova or even to, to Ireland. Uh, and it's a product, you know, as a nation, Greece is already quite well known uh, around the world. Uh, it already has its own um, nation brand, if you like. Now, as we go back to your question, um, yes, we're planning, you know, every Wednesday and Thursday, we host these um, these broadcasts on the, the IMC streaming uh, platform. Um, we have uh, plans to gather up our regional offices uh, in the next few weeks. So, you know, we have an office in Hong Kong, we have an office um, in, uh, in London, uh, in New York, and also in Grand Cayman. Um, but we're also planning to bring together the um, heads of the CIUs for a special one-off uh, Caribbean uh, program, uh, where we will have hopefully all five uh, of the Caribbean programs. Uh, and we expect in the Caribbean, like they have done post-hurricane uh, season, where a couple of years ago, if you remember with the hurricanes, they launched and the hurricane recovery uh, options. Uh, we expect that uh, the likes of St. Lucia, Grenada, Dominica, St. Kitts, uh, and Antigua Barbuda will most probably launch uh, special programs for post-COVID-19 reconstruction of their economies. Um, so there's a lot happening in that space. Uh, and then the United States, we know that uh, President Trump has issued an executive order uh, to ban immigration for 60 days. Um, but interestingly enough, he's actually kept um, EB-5 out of that executive order. So if you are planning uh, an EB-5 petition to enter the United States, that doesn't stop you from progressing with that petition. The only thing that might be a little bit difficult, of course, is that US consulates remain closed for the foreseeable mm -hmm. future uh, until the, um, the US decides to reopen those. Uh, but nothing, you, nothing stopping you, um, you, know, uh, you know, sort of filing those petitions if you can and getting that paperwork uh, in order and ready. But, you know, so that's my side. Um, I think what's interesting, um, given that this is an Asia panel, is actually what I want to hear for our viewers uh, from, uh, you know, David, Jennifer, uh, Oscar and, uh, and Joe, what do your clients want post COVID-19? What are their financial strategies, very briefly, uh, but also what is the ideal program uh, in terms of residency uh, or citizenship? Uh, and that may be sort of inclining towards, um, you know, real estate. Uh, it could be, you know, other asset classes uh, like um, uh, stock exchange, secondary stock exchanges, uh, biomedical, we've heard as well. What do your clients want to see um, out of uh, any future programs? Uh, so have a think about that. And I'm just going to launch the final uh, poll that we have for today. And that's going to come up on your screen. I'm just going to give four seconds for that one because I think that's quite um, an, um, an easy one to, to answer. And it'll give my panelists the opportunity to think about the question I've put to them. All right, well, let's. 
Uh, let's publish those results. It's an overwhelming 89% uh, think that yes, there will be more countries and just you know 11% think uh, not. So let me hide that and give the, the microphone back to Jennifer. Uh, what do your clients want to see in future programs? Oh, uh, that's actually a very good question. Also, this is a question I always ask uh, <laughs> my my clients, my team, and also whenever I have a chance uh, in the meeting with um, uh, the head of CIU of different countries, right? I think for the um, Asian perspective uh, of being a Chinese of Hong Kong, I think a property investment is always a, a very hot uh, a product. So anything related to properties, um, I think we will definitely be attractive. Um, and of course, um, when we look at the um, investments overseas, of course, risk is also managed. Risk management is something that we, we need to uh, put an eye on. So I think uh, products with uh, a good investment return, low investment risk and related to property investment um, would be um, would be attractive uh, for my my side. Yeah. Okay. But I don't know about, how about David. Do you share the same or, or do you have different views? Oh yeah, I, actually, uh, Jennifer, I agree with you. I think uh, at least for the uh, clients from uh, uh, mainland China and Hong Kong, uh, they, they 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 would like like a property uh, related program. And also, I think if some European countries, uh, if they can offer like a blue law destination right, for example, maybe Greece, if they can have a kind of uh, citizenship by investment program. I think it will be, uh, of course, with a good, uh, with a good value, uh, with a uh, okay. So uh, I think it will be become very popular in uh, mainland China market. And Joe and, and Oscar, I know you guys are not coming from uh, a migration immigration industry, but I think you must see a lot of clients who are interested in the immigration, um, helping maybe some of your high net worth clients who are actually looking for options. And what's your view on, on this question? Maybe Joe first. Yeah, if, I, if I may share my two cents, I'm definitely not a immigration expert, but in the high net worth clients that we're dealing with, I do say I do feel a lot more urgency in their minds of getting protection in terms of you know, insurance, in terms of setting up trust, and definitely uh, in their minds uh, are looking into some other programs that are being offered. So uh, I think once the borders are opened, where we can meet our clients, the, the demands will be, will, be, will be pleasantly surprised about the amount of demand of, of, of these safety measures for them. Okay, great. Thank you. And Oscar, how about you? Do, do you think, what were your clients, uh, for example, some of your clients, or mm. maybe your, your other sales clients, what, what are they looking for? What would be ideal programs for, for, for your clients? Yeah, I, uh, 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 our company has around uh, 300,000 registered clients, which are all, or most of them are all high net worth clients. And uh, from our uh, uh, statistics uh, uh, numbers, we found that over 40% of the uh, uh, clients, as a whole family uh, point of view, they have already has another identifications, not only the passport holders or the permanent residents. So I think the trend will going forward will still going on after the post, uh, uh, post the COVID-19 because that uh, just to use you can see uh, during the whole whole picture uh, uh, of this this pandemic is starting from uh, Wuhan from China and spread to Japan to Korea and go to the European Italy and go to the US and after that they come back to the Middle East and to Iran to maybe to to India so this is that the, the timing is spread everywhere so for people i think some of our clients just uh, we chat me and whatsapp me that uh, i want my family diversify globally i want my son going to 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 europe to to uk i want my daughter to us i want my my family to go uh, stay in, in in china so globalization is still a very hot topic uh, after the the pandemic i believe that but the problem that there's still another voice, another rising trend that the globalization is, is I think it's is dangerous. So, so it's very interesting, but I believe that uh, from the high networks and the family offices, the clients, 
most of them have the capability, financial capability to doing the immigration, to doing the, the globalization. This is really, really good things for, for them. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, that these are all super interesting. Just latching up on what Oscar said, I think we really have to monitor the airline industry as well in the next few months. We know that you know some of the big carriers, uh, Virgin Australia has filed for bankruptcy. Uh, British Airways has announced a layoff of, I think, one a third of its uh, workforce today. We still, you know, haven't heard much from the American carriers uh, as yet. Uh, but I think we have to look at, you know, and see what's happening in the airline industry because it could be that although oil prices are at a historic low, um, in actual fact, depending on social distancing rules um, that take into effect, um, you know, the number of airlines uh, available to us, the cost of a ticket may, you know, double, triple or quadruple in price, which would certainly affect in some, some respect uh, the business of uh, immigration. We have a question because uh, we've just got a few minutes left now. Um, we have a question from uh, Paniotis uh, Michalides, uh, who's in Cyprus. It's a question for, for Jennifer uh, from Henley & Partners, one of the, you know, the, the larger global firms uh, handling uh, citizenship and uh, residency by investment. Um, he would like to know, um, from a percentage perspective, um, how COVID-19 has affected your immigration business um, in let's let's look at uh, Asia as a whole. So, have you seen your business since February, you know, go down by you know 25, 50 percent, uh, or has it increased? You know, what you know from a percentage perspective, what's that been like, uh, Jennifer? Mm, well, that's a, actually a very big question, but thank you for the questions. <laughs> I, I will try to gather um, my notes uh, and think about I think um, during the, so we have a very good uh, uh, January, I would have to say that, um, um, because um, because when we're talking about the residence and citizenship program, uh, some of them actually have a longer processing time. So if some clients engage us in, uh, in 2019, of course, we will still get them on board in 2020. And we do see a decrease um, in numbers of application because during the uh, we, uh, February or March, we start to see lockdowns. So even a lot of, uh, like I mentioned earlier, a lot of clients, if they, for example, uh, have engaged us for, for example, multi program, service program, um, particle program, uh, and the programs where they need to land, even though for Hong Kong, a resident program where they have to come to Hong Kong to, do, to get the biometric, get the visa or ID card, and they were not able to come in. So then that caused a decrease in numbers because first they know that they will not be able to uh, complete the process of the biometric. And of course, they would decide to postpone it maybe in quarter three or quarter four. So, um, well, long story short, I mean, briefly, in, in brief, long story short, I think we do see the decrease um, um, in the applications, I would say, in, uh, in, in March. March uh, is a month that we see uh, quite low in uh, application submissions. But I, I would like to also extend that question to um, David, which is shared the same way in the same industry. Are you act actually experienced the same? Uh, yeah, definitely. We have the same size story. Oh, <laughs> I, I hope I answered the question. I hope we answered the question. <laughs> I think in, round, in the roundabout way it does, because it's self-explanatory, isn't it? When you've got lockdown, um, you can't obtain the documentation that you need to complete and file a proper petition or an application. So I think that that's quite that's quite normal. As much as you know, post COVID nineteen, we'll probably see more digitization of government services and other services, which will follow what you know financial services has been doing for you know a very long time now. Uh, but other sectors of the economy have been quite slow uh, to catch up on. Um, and I think post COVID nineteen, I think. Personally, I think that will probably change the situation. Um, we need to wrap up now, but I just want to ask each of um, the panelists um, some uh, closing remarks uh, on how uh, things pan out for the future. Let's look into the um, in, in the next uh, six months uh, until the end of 2020. What do you, you know? What are your um, short 
uh, predictions and perhaps maybe very, very briefly your medium predictions for 2021. We'll start with uh, Oscar. Yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Bruno. I think uh, everybody knows that uh, the pandemic will end eventually, but nobody knows the, when it will be end and in what forms. But my, my thing is that my point of view that uh, uh, we can find a lot of opportunities uh, during the dark time. So we can still do a lot of things for, for not only for our lives, for our families, but also for our business. So I still optimistic for for future uh, after the uh, six months or in 2021. 20, uh, so, so I hope everyone and every business will be better, much better than before. And God, God bless everyone in the world. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Joe, your predictions? Yeah, indeed. Um, I'm, I'm also quite optimistic in this part of the world in terms of how next couple of quarters will be out. Uh, we, we do hope for a, when China gradually opens up, we do hope for a gradual uh, rebound. In fact, uh, in the month of April is actually Trico's China record month in terms of revenue. Uh, this was, that's, that's, that's something to cheer about. And in the longer term, of course, it all depends on how the US and Europe is handling the crisis. Uh, uh, US is still the, the biggest contributor to global GDP. If that slows down, we will get hit uh, on this part of the world. By echoing Oscar, I do see a lot of potential good opportunities for us to buy, for us to invest uh, in terms of stocks or MA targets. So yeah, keep keep alert and you might find some good deals. Yeah. Je Jennifer? Yeah, I think I, I, I share the same here as uh, uh, Joe and Oscar. I'm very optimistic and I think I see also more of opportunities, which is already seen um, some clients which is on hold for February, March, they start to ask questions and, and start to have some movements in, in April. So I was I would say that there will be more movements and then after we bound. And because I think um, we, we're in the world with the globalization, I think we will see people we will see for people being a global uh, citizens or, or resident everywhere in the world. So I think we'll see more movements in, in later this year and then 2021. Thank you. D David, your final thoughts? Okay. Yeah, I, for me, I think I, I, for uh, most of the business, especially for our business, uh, like action uh, service business, I think uh, most important is like uh, uh, each firm, they uh, they need to uh, try to get through uh, in a difficult 2020. And then I uh, prepare like uh, for the uh, I think uh, for 2020, uh, 2021, so uh, eventually, uh, especially with uh, uh, with some like the uh, policy, good policy uh, from the uh, other countries, uh, for example, the European countries for the migration business, I think uh, the market will, uh, will be very good, uh, very well like in Hopefully to the end of the, this year, that uh, will be like 2021. And uh, also, uh, in the last, I hope uh, the members of the NC, uh, everybody stay safe and healthy in, like you guys in Europe, and also some people in North America, and uh, uh, people are in Africa, Middle East, and uh, Asia. Fantastic. Uh, thank you. We, we, you know, we are, this has been really interesting, but we are going to um, have to wrap up. I know, uh, of course, it's getting late in, uh, in Asia. I want to thank um, today's panelists uh, and speakers, David, Joe, uh, Oscar, uh, and of course, uh, my co-host, Jennifer. Uh, please do reach out to them through their LinkedIn uh, profiles and make new connections because this is the time when uh, we're a little bit more connected through social media uh, and through other uh, online professional platforms. Uh, so please do reach out to them if you've got any questions um, about today's uh, discussion. Uh, please uh, email the IMC uh, or my fellow speakers. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, thank you, the audience at home. I hope you found. Uh, today's session interesting. 
If you're not already a member uh, of the IMC, uh, then please open the handout in the uh, GoToWebinar panel on the right of your screen uh, and find some information about joining us. Uh, if you are in Asia, uh, please contact Jennifer uh, directly. She'll be more than happy uh, to help you. Uh, and if you are a member already, visit our websites for uh, daily updates on what is happening in the industry right now. Uh, tomorrow we'll be back at 2.30 Central European Summertime uh, and our guest speaker will be uh, fellow IMC board member, uh, Professor Andres Solimano, uh, who's a former chair uh, of the uh, Economic Unit for the World Bank uh, in South America. So we'll be um, dialing into uh, Santiago uh, in Chile tomorrow. Uh, aside from that, uh, as my uh, fellow panelists said today, uh, please stay safe, uh, stay healthy, uh, and of course, uh, stay sanitized through your hands as well. So thank you very much, uh, and it's goodbye, and we'll play the small video for the IMC for you now. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Migration from the Investment Migration Council, the first structured learning product of its kind globally, designed for you. Explore the bite-sized learning pathway of each module on our custom online platform. You can track your progress as you go and learn at a pace that suits you, with an estimated five hours of study time per module. The certification in investment migration contributes to the development of professional competencies and standards for those new to or already working in the industry. So, what are you waiting for? Visit our website to start your learning journey today.